Okay, so before we start, a reminder about the uh, Career Pathways uh, event on Tuesday on Zoom. Uh, I did check with the department about recording that. If you're not available at that time, they did say that they will probably record it, uh, but it's going to involve multiple breakout rooms. So they, they do say if you can participate uh, live, then that would be best and you'd get more out of it that way. So we encourage you. Uh, to participate in this live. Uh, all of these topics are things that you would be interested in, I hope. Uh, and uh, if you're not able to do it live, then, um, then there would be the, the backup option of recording. Okay, so we're talking about enolate alkylations. Uh, we're gonna continue, whoops, that's the wrong chapter, continue our discussion of enolate alkylations. Uh, and then we'll talk about some related processes uh, to enolate alkylations that solve some of the limitations of enolate alkylations that we'll learn about today. And those two processes are called the malonic ester synthesis and the acetoacetic ester synthesis. Those are commonly used in multi-step syntheses. Uh, and so that's certainly something uh, you could expect to see uh, on an exam coming up in a few weeks. Uh, and then we'll start chapter 24 uh, and focusing on the aldol reaction. So when we were talking about enolate alkylations, um, we said that you can react enolates with methyl halides or primary halides uh, to form carbon-carbon bonds. If we have an unsymmetrical ketone, like the one I've drawn for you here on the board, uh, you have uh, the problem of there being two possible enolates, your kinetic versus thermodynamic enolate. So if you want to attach your new alkyl halide, your new alkyl group, to the less substituted carbon, you're going to need to generate the kinetic enolate. And we do that with LDA, THF, low temperature. And then we add our methyl halide in this case, and this is the product we would obtain. If we want to attach our alkyl group to the more substituted carbon of our ketone, then we need to make the thermodynamic enolate, and that's going to require us to use sodium ethoxide, ethanol as the solvent, room temperature. The way I've drawn the equilibrium arrows reminds us that um, the equilibrium is unfavorable. We get just a small amount of this enolate, but the... Uh, alkylation of that enolate is going to be thermodynamically, it's going to be irreversible, I should say. And so we can use Le Chatelier's principle to drive this process through this unfavorable equilibrium and obtain this uh, di-substituted product, this constitutional isomer of the product shown above. Now, I will mention that uh, in the real world, in practical terms, this thermodynamic enolate alkylation process usually doesn't work as well as the kinetic enolate process. Because this is thermodynamic and depends on equilibrium, you don't have exclusively this enolate. It'll be the major enolate, but you might have like a three to one ratio of this enolate to that enolate. So you're still gonna get mixtures when you, do, uh, when you use a thermodynamic enolate, even though the mixtures will favor the product you want. So it's not ideal. It usually, usually works better when you are uh, generating the kinetic enolate, okay? So uh, there are a couple of problems. Well, before we go into the problems, I should show you this example here on the screen of an enolate alkylation used to synthesize a, a very uh, prominent anti-cancer agent. This is called tamoxifen, um, used to treat breast cancer. Uh, and one step in its synthesis involves alkylation of this particular enolate. You'll notice that they used sodium hydride in this reaction. Sodium hydride is a strong base uh, comparable to LDA in its strength. It's typically only used when there's only one possible enolate you can obtain. If you look at this ketone, there's no alpha hydrogens on this side of the ketone. There's only alpha hydrogens here. Uh, and so there's only one enolate that can form. Because sodium hydride is the world's smallest base, it's not very good at selectively generating kinetic enolates. Right? It's going to generate the thermodynamic enolate almost as fast as the kinetic enolate. So if you, had, if you use sodium hydride with this ketone, 
you'd get pretty close to a one-to-one -one mixture of kinetic and thermodynamic enolates. So sodium hydride is usually only used when there's only one possible enolate that you can form, as is the case in this example. Any questions? All right, so now let's talk about some limitations. Enolate uh, alkylation reactions are very useful forming carbon-carbon bonds, uh, but there are some problems, okay? Let's list a couple of the problems. The first problem is elimination. Our enolate is a very strong base, and we can have elimination of sensitive alkyl halides. We've already told you that enolate alkylation does not work with secondary alkyl halides, that it will eliminate secondary alkyl halides uh, in preference to substituting them. Even with some primary alkyl halides, we can have elimination. And I'll show you an example. This comes from my own lab. Uh, this is one of my graduate students that worked in my lab many years ago. And he was trying to generate an enolate of this diester. This is a diester, but it's symmetrical. Uh, so it doesn't matter if you deprotonate here or here. We do have the OH group, and we used excess LDA. Uh, we deprotonated first that oxygen uh, and then made an enolate. That's kind of a shortcut to using a protecting group, using excess base that allowed us to avoid the protecting group. Uh, but we still had a problem. We added our alkyl halide, uh, and instead of performing the alkylation and generating the desired carbon-carbon bond, it underwent elimination. Why was this alkyl halide more prone to elimination than a normal primary alkyl halide? Right? This, this was undesired. We didn't want it to happen, but looking at the product, we could see why it did happen. Yes, Trent? Exactly. We have a conjugated double bond here. Uh, and in the transition state leading to this product, you're going to have a partial double bond that's conjugated. That's going to lower the energy of that transition state and make it easier for that E2 reaction to occur than it would with a regular primary alkyl halide. Okay? So even with some primary alkyl halides, you can have elimination instead of the desired alkylation. And this is an example uh, from my own lab. I should mention that TBS uh, is actually an abbreviation for an abbreviation. It's the same thing as a TBDMS group that we learned about in the last section of the class, the tert butyl dimethylsilyl ether. Organic chemists like abbreviations so much that sometimes we abbreviate the abbreviations. Uh, but uh, that's just the same thing uh, as a TBDMS group. It's a protecting group protecting an alcohol there. All right, so there's a prime example of why elimination of sensitive alkyl halides, particularly alkyl halides that will give you a conjugated double bond, is going to impede your attempts to perform an alkylation. The second problem comes when you want to perform a dialkylation. If you want to add two alkyl groups to the same carbon, which many times you do want to do this, that is going to be problematic. If we look at this product I've drawn here, where we have two alkyl groups to the alpha carbon uh, of this ketone, if we started with cyclohexanone, so, so let's say we had attached the methyl group over here by an alkylation reaction, that would work fine. But then if we wanted to attach a second methyl group at the same carbon, we would need to use the thermodynamic enolate. And I just told you, that the thermodynamic enolate typically gives us problems. It usually, even though it's the major enolate, you still have some of the kinetic enolate in there, and you get mixtures of products, so you get lower yields of the product you want. Okay, so that's, uh, that's a problem that we face uh, sometimes. So, uh, organic chemists fortunately have come up with solutions uh, to these problems, uh, and one of those solutions involves a process known as the malonic ester synthesis. So malonic ester, also known as diethylmalonate, is derived from a carboxylic acid known as malonic acid. Back in chapter 19, there were some common names for 
dicarboxylic acids we learned. So if this wasn't an ester, if it was a dicarboxylic acid, it would be called malonic acid. And so that's where this name, malonic ester synthesis, comes from. Through a sequence of reactions, we can convert malonic ester into a molecule such as this, which is an alkylated version of acetic acid. This is like performing an alkylation on an enolate of acetic acid. Or we could attach two alkyl groups. They could be the same, they could be different. Okay, so over a, a course of a few steps, we're going to take our malonic ester and we're going to form carbon-carbon bonds between this carbon and primary alkyl halides, and we're gonna end up generating products like this. Um, there's a key step that we have to understand that occurs in this process with a dicarboxylic acid, a 1,3-dicarboxylic acid. So we're gonna have this uh, type of intermediate Okay, so I've drawn for you, so this is malonic acid itself. Uh, and we call it a 1,3-dicarboxylic acid because of the 1,3 relationship between our two carboxylic acid groups. When you heat up a 1,3-dicarboxylic acid, a special reaction occurs, a rearrangement reaction occurs, where our carbon-oxygen pi electrons are going to grab the proton from the neighboring carboxylic acid group. The electrons in the oxygen-hydrogen bond are going to go here, forming a new carbon-oxygen double bond. And in response to that, we're actually going to cleave a carbon-carbon sigma bond. So this is an unusual reaction because it is cleaving a carbon-carbon sigma bond. Those are strong bonds. We don't often see that. But there's a driving force for that in this reaction. That is the generation of carbon dioxide. If you look at this subunit right here, that's turning into carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a very, very stable molecule. And then the other portion of the molecule turns into this enediol, right? This is a type of enol species, okay? So we overcome the thermodynamic penalty for cleaving a strong carbon-carbon sigma bond by generating a very strong, a very stable molecule, carbon dioxide, and also by forming two products from one. So entropically, uh, this process is also favorable. And then our enol, that tautomerizes, the e because it's an enediol, we tautomerize the enol, and what we're left with is a carboxylic acid. Okay, so what we've done is cleave a carbon-carbon bond in our 1,3-dicarboxylic acid. We give off CO2, and our carboxylic acid remains. Because we've lost CO2, this process is known as decarboxylation. Okay, decarboxylation is a key step in the malonic ester synthesis. And then there's a related process... So you don't have to have a 1,3-dicarboxylic acid for these types of reactions to occur. You just have to have any type of carbonyl on the beta carbon relative to a carboxylic acid. So we can take a compound like this. This is a beta-keto acid. Here's our carboxylic acid, here's our alpha carbon, here's our beta carbon. A beta keto carboxylic acid. We can heat that up. Same thing happens. We give off our CO2. We're contributing to global warming a little bit, I guess, but uh, uh, usually we're doing this on a fairly small scale. Then we get our enol, and then that enol is just going to tautomerize. We could draw equilibrium arrows if we want, but it's going to be largely uh, favoring formation of the ketone.
So decarboxylation happens with 1,3-dicarboxylic acids, and it happens with beta-keto esters. Any questions? Yes. So, um, yes, but instead of having the heat, you're going to have an enzyme lowering the activation energy because uh, usually the temperatures required for this are hotter than what you would have in nature. Uh, but there are decarboxylations in nature, uh, and you would have a similar sort of uh, curved arrow mechanism for that, uh, just with an enzyme involved. Okay? All right. Uh, so let's go through the steps of the malonic ester synthesis. We're going to start with our diethylmalonate. And we're going to react it with ethoxide. Okay. So we always use the base that corresponds to the alkyl group of the ester. Because if the base uh, attacks the carbonyl of the ester, uh, then it doesn't change the ester that you have if you're using the same alkyl group. Uh, but what it's normally going to do is deprotonate and make an enolate. Okay. And that's going to be um, essentially an irreversible process because the pKa of ethanol is like, um, you know, 16 point something. The pKa, if you remember uh, from our last chapter of 1,3-diester, uh, uh, is going to be about 13. Okay, so this is a very favorable acid-base reaction. Right? Generating our enolate. We're producing ethanol as a byproduct. Okay. Right, so that's step one. Then in step two, we add our alkyl halide. And the R group has to be a primary group. This has to be a primary alkyl halide in this reaction. Allowing an SN2 process to occur. Okay, so now we've attached our alkyl group to the alpha carbon uh, of our enolate. And then in the third step, we add acid and heat. Okay, now there are uh, two things that are going to happen when we add acid and heat. Let's talk about the first one. What happens when we expose esters to aqueous acid? What happens to those esters? Ester hydrolysis, right? The reverse of the Fischer esterification. So we're going to convert our diester into a diacid. And we're heating the reaction mixture. So what happens to our 1,3-dicarboxylic acid in the presence of heat? It's up here. What happens to it? It's going to decarboxylate. So this is uh, two steps happening, uh, two transformations happening at once. First, or sequentially, I should say. First, we hydrolyze those two esters to give a 1,3-diacid. And then that 1,3-diacid undergoes decarboxylation. So we're going to produce CO2, and we're also going to produce a product that looks like an alkylated version of acetic acid. Right? So if we were, if we were looking at this in terms of retrosynthesis, um, this is the bond we're forming. If we're looking at retrosynthesis, we would disconnect this into an alkyl halide and our 1,3-diester, uh, but it looks like an alkylated version of acetic acid, okay? 
So we can also perform dialkylations. I told you that di uh, dialkylation is a problem with normal enolates. And so one advantage of the malonic ester synthesis is it makes dialkylation easy because we can just do, we can perform a second alkylation reaction prior to the decarboxylation. Okay. So we're going to add our sodium ethoxide. And then we're going to add a primary alkyl halide. In this case, let's just use uh, bromoethane. That's going to give us this product. Okay, then we add another equivalent of base. Let's add a second primary alkyl halide. Let's use benzyl bromide this time, right? This chlorine, this is a primary alkyl halide. So that's going to allow us to attach a benzyl group. Okay. Now we add our acid and our heat. Hydrolyze our two esters, carboxylic or, or carbon dioxide goes away, uh, and then we end up with our carboxylic acid product. Here's our ethyl group. Here's our benzyl group. Okay. So these two groups are the ones that we attached. This ethyl group and benzyl group are the ones we attached using the malonic ester synthesis. Uh, so if you're, you're trying to form carboxylic acids of this type with two different primary alkyl groups attached to your alpha carbon, then the malonic ester synthesis is going to be a really good way to do that. Okay. It's also useful if we're trying to attach two alkyl groups, or, or if we're trying to perform a uh, make a ring with a dihalide. I'll show you what I mean by that. Okay. Let's use one equivalent of our base. And we're going to follow that with this dibromide. This is 1,4-dibromobutane that I've drawn for you here. Okay, so so with the dibromide, we're going to alkylate one of those bromines. We're going to get this compound here. We still have an alpha hydrogen remaining. We're going to deprotonate that. I'm not going to write a one. We just use sodium ethoxide because we still have uh, our halide uh, as part of that molecule. And that's going to cyclize, allowing us to form a ring. If we count our carbons, one, two, three, four, five, that's going to be a five-membered ring. Okay, so we performed dialkylation with a dihalide, and now We'll use this empty space here. We add our acid and our heat, hydrolyze our esters, decarboxylate, and we end up with a carboxylic acid looking like this. Okay. And the two bonds that we formed in this reaction are the two bonds to our alpha carbon. Any questions? So dialkylation, making rings, these are all very good uses of this malonic ester synthesis. So um, I've alluded to it uh, as I've been drawing on the board, uh, but it's important to be able to use this reaction in a retrosynthetic fashion, uh, namely to look at a carboxylic acid and decide what building blocks you could use to create that carboxylic acid. 
As long as your alkyl groups are methyl groups or primary alkyl groups, you can disconnect them from the alpha carbon and they can be formed from alkyl halides. So you see here these three different boxes, the way that the book has done this. These carbons are coming from malonic ester. This is coming from iodomethane. This is coming from 1-bromobutane. And then here's how you would write the synthesis uh, in the forward direction. Okay? Trent? Um, on the second step of this morning, um, what's the key to the Yes. Yes, that's a very good question. So this base, it can do more than one thing. With primary alkyl halides, substitution is usually favored. So that's a Williamson ether synthesis, right? So to prevent it from doing a Williamson ether synthesis, you don't have these two in the reaction mixture at the same time. So you add the base first, that makes your enolate. Your enolate is less basic and therefore less, uh, it, you know, the, the enolate is nucleophilic on carbon as opposed to oxygen. And so that's going to do the desired SN2 and you've prevented it from doing a Williamson ether reaction. Okay. That, that's the reason why I drew this in two steps. Some of you might be wondering, why can't you just add your two equivalents of base at the same time? If you did that, you would start to see some Williamson ether synthesis occur. Yes. It could, but it turns out that this hydrogen is going to be more acidic than the hydrogen, or, the, or is going to be acidic enough that your enolate formation is going to be faster than that Williamson ether reaction. Okay, so, 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 so once you get to this point, uh, if it has, it, it, it works out so that you get the uh, desired process to occur. But if you have too much base, if you add two equivalents of base, you have excess base in there. Now you're enabling some of those other pathways to, to occur. Okay, good question. All right, so uh, we've shown you how to use this in a retrosynthetic fashion. Uh, it's time to practice that, so let's get our eye clickers out. We have a malonic ester synthesis up here, a product. Go ahead and talk to your neighbors and decide which of the halides below would be used in that reaction. All right, let's try to get our final answers in. Next few seconds. Okay, any more answers? There we go, we got a couple more. Any more? All right, that looks like all that we have. Okay, which alkyl halide do we use? B, very good. We can eliminate A and D right away, why? 
Are they primary alkyl halides? Certainly not. So these would not react at all in an, this would eliminate, this would not react at all uh, in an acetyl, in, in a melonic ester synthesis. This one, you'd have to count your carbons, uh, would give you an extra carbon because it's this bond right here that's being formed. Okay, very good. Yes. So the secondary alkyl halides will undergo elimination. Um, although in the case with normal enolates, they will undergo elimination. With these types of enolates, the enolates you get from malonic ester, usually they just won't react at all. Those enolates are less basic than normal enolates, but they're also less nucleophilic. Okay, so because these extra resonance stabilized enolates from a 1,3-dicarbonyl compound are less basic, they're also less nucleophilic. So they're only nucleophilic enough to react with the primary alkyl halide. Okay. So this wouldn't work. This wouldn't work because we don't do SN2 reactions with aryl halide. Okay, very good. Okay, there is a cousin to the malonic ester synthesis known as the acetoacetic ester synthesis. And that's a little bit of a tongue twister. Uh, but acetoacetic ester is a beta keto ester. I've drawn it for you right here. It's also known as ethyl acetoacetate. You should know what the structure of ethyl acetate looks like. If we carved out this acetyl group, what we would have is ethyl acetate. But, but we have this acetyl group attached to ethyl acetate, so therefore it is called ethyl acetoacetate, okay? So we start with that molecule and going through a similar set of steps to the uh, malonic ester synthesis, we end up with products like this, which look like alkylated versions of acetone. So whereas the malonic ester synthesis gives us alkylated versions of acetic acid, the acetoacetic ester synthesis gives us alkylated versions of acetone. You might ask, why not alkylate acetone itself? We'll explain why you might want to use this method uh, in a few moments. But first, let's go through the steps, and they're the same three steps that we have in the malonic ester synthesis. I've drawn the first one for you. We use our ethoxide base. We deprotonate. The pKa of a beta keto ester is around 11, so this is going to be an irreversible deprotonation, giving us this uh, extra resonance stabilized enolate as we just mentioned, a little less reactive than a normal enolate, but reactive enough uh, that you can uh, react it with a primary alkyl halide, right? This has to be a primary alkyl halide, but the primary alkyl halide will react with that enolate. So we've now attached our primary alkyl group uh, to that alpha carbon. And then in our third step, we add our acid and our heat. The acid is going to hydrolyze our ester to give the carboxylic acid. The heat is going to drive off CO2. So we're going to be left with our alkylated version of acetone. Uh, and then, of course, we form CO2 as a byproduct, okay? So it's the same three steps as the malonic ester synthesis, but because we have used a beta keto ester, then uh, we have ended up with a ketone in the product as opposed to a carboxylic acid. Uh, and if we were to perform two sequential alkylations prior to the decarboxylation, we would end up with a product looking like this, okay? So I asked the question earlier, why acetone is a very simple molecule. Why not just use acetone? Why not just perform, a dialk perform an alkylation or a dialkylation of acetone? Why would you go through the extra hassle of doing this decarboxylation uh, in the acetoacetic ester synthesis versus just alkylating acetone? There's actually uh, three reasons why the acetoacetic ester synthesis would be better than alkylation of acetone. And the first one, first reason, is that LDA 
is more expensive than sodium ethoxide. Okay? In the acetoacetic ester synthesis, we're using sodium ethoxide as a base. So if you were going to do this reaction industrially, the cost of the base might be significant. Uh, and so being able to use sodium ethoxide would be cheaper. And then also, LDA requires anhydrous conditions, meaning that you have to keep it away from water. As an organic chemist, you learn that water is everywhere. Unless you make special efforts to exclude water, water is going to be present in every reaction you perform. Water is present in the air. Water is present in your solvents. It's present in your reactants. It's everywhere. If you expose LDA to water, what happens? LDA is a very strong base. It gets protonated, so you destroy your LDA with water, right? So you have to put in extra effort to remove water in order to use LDA, right? And so that's difficult sometimes, especially on an industrial scale. If you're trying to make kilograms of a product, you've got to keep the water out. Sodium ethoxide, it's not going to matter. If you have a little bit of water in there, you'll get a little bit of hydroxide, but a little bit of hydroxide is fine. It's going to do the same thing that the ethoxide is doing in this reaction. It's not going to cause you a problem. So it's going to be simpler to run the reaction with acetoacetic ester than acetone because you'd be using LDA in the case of alkylating acetone. Okay, so that's one practical reason. Another one is that the acetoacetic ester is better for dialkylation. Okay. If you needed to do a dialkylation of acetone, in your second step, you would need to form a thermodynamic enolate. And we explained how that's problematic. You've got this unfavorable equilibrium that you can overcome, but many times the yields of the product are not great. And I also mentioned that even though the thermodynamic enolate is major, you typically have at least some of the kinetic enolate in there, and you get mixtures of products that further erodes your yield. So if you want a dialkylated product, such as something like this, you can bypass the whole thermodynamic enolate issue by using the acetoacetic ester synthesis. Okay? So that's also advantageous. And then the enolate you get in the acetoacetic ester synthesis is less basic than the enolate from acetone and therefore is less prone to elimination. Okay, I showed you that example from my lab where we tried to perform the alkylation of a normal enolate and it didn't work because we had elimination instead. Well, my student was able to solve the problem by using a beta keto ester instead of a normal ester in that reaction. Uh, this molecule is called diethyl acetone dicarboxylate, and so that's our abbreviation dead C for uh, diethyl acetone dicarboxylate. Uh, in this case, we use sodium hydride. We could have used sodium ethoxide, but sodium hydride is also a convenient base. Uh, and because it's symmetrical, it doesn't matter which of these two sites we deprotonate at. Uh, we added our alkyl halide, and you'll notice we got the desired product. This was the carbon-carbon bond we were trying to form. We got a good yield. We didn't have elimination problems because the resonance stabilized enolate from the beta-keto ester is less basic than the enolate derived from the regular ester. Okay, So we suppressed the elimination that had happened in the other case. Now that came at a cost because the enolate is less basic. It's also less nucleophilic. So it's less reactive. You can see we had to heat our reaction mixture and we had to let it stir for six days. Usually you want your reaction to finish in hours rather than days. Uh, and so that uh, was a little bit less desirable. Uh, we also added some sodium iodide, which converted the bromide into the iodide in situ to make it a better leaving group, to make it more reactive. But even with that, uh, it was a fairly lengthy reaction time due to the lower nucleophilicity. But we got the desired product, 
because we could suppress the elimination. So these are the three reasons why you would want to perform an uh, acetoacetic ester synthesis or a malonic ester synthesis rather than just alkylating acetone uh, or rather than just alkylating ethyl acetate. Any questions? Okay, well, let's uh, turn the page and start chapter 24. Chapter 24 is called carbonyl condensation reactions. This is where we are reacting an enolate with a carbonyl compound as an electrophile. So sometimes we'll be reacting two molecules of the same compound together, just turning part of it into an enolate. Um, other times we'll be reacting them with uh, other carbonyl compounds. Uh, the reaction we're going to start out with is called the aldol reaction. This just shows you here a general example of an aldol reaction, an enolate reacting with uh, an aldehyde being used as our electrophile uh, generating a product looking like this. So this is a nucleophilic addition reaction we learned in chapter 21. Um, we're using another carbonyl compound as the electrophile. That's what's different uh, from this. Uh, or we, I'm sorry, we're using an other carbonyl compound as the nucleophile. We're using an enolate as the nucleophile. That's what makes it different from the reactions we learned in previous chapters. So the aldol reaction, there are different versions of it. The simplest version involves two of the same molecule. We're going to use two equivalents of an aldehyde. We're going to draw it with acetaldehyde first, our simplest aldehyde. Uh, and we're going to use base, we're going to use hydroxide and water in this reaction. Uh, and it's going to be an equilibrium process. When I draw the product, you'll see why we call it the aldol reaction, because the product has an aldehyde and an alcohol present in it. So it's just a mixture of those two words. Okay. Uh, let's draw the mechanism. You'll see I drew equilibrium arrows. You'll notice it forms a carbon-carbon bond, so it's going to be uh, an important reaction for us. So we start off with our aldehyde, and we have our base, our hydroxide. Uh, how are these two components going to react with each other? How's the base going to react with our aldehyde? What was that? Yeah, it's going to make an enolate. Okay, we're going to deprotonate alpha hydrogen and make an enolate. Is that going to be thermodynamically favored? No, if we use hydroxide or an alkoxide, the equilibrium is going to favor the carbonyl compound. But as you'll see, that's what we want. We want it to favor the carbonyl compound because we only want a small fraction of enolate. We want most of our aldehyde to remain as the aldehyde because the enolate is going to react with the aldehyde. If we had 100% of the enolate, there would be no aldehyde left for it to react with. But if we have an unfavorable equilibrium and a small amount of aldehyde, then that enolate can act as a nucleophile and attack the aldehyde. Okay, That's also going to be a reversible process. That's going to give us a product looking like this. And then we can protonate that with water, giving us our aldol product and regenerating hydroxide. Okay, And you'll notice that we produced water in this step, so we eliminate out water. Water is a byproduct. Uh, of this reaction. Okay. Any questions about our aldol mechanism? Enolate formation, nucleophilic addition, followed by proton transfer. Just three steps. Okay. So this equilibrium is unfavorable for ketones, but generally favorable for aldehydes. This equilibrium is always unfavorable. The overall equilibrium of the reaction is usually favorable with aldehydes, 
but not with ketones. Another thing to mention about this is because it's a re an equilibrium, it's a reversible process, the reverse aldol or the retroaldol reaction is also possible. Meaning that you could take a beta hydroxyaldehyde, treat it with base, deprotonate the OH, and then have this intermediate fragment. This intermediate would fragment to give an aldehyde and an enolate, and then you would just protonate the enolate. That's fairly common in nature, in biosynthesis. Sometimes in nature, we need to cleave carbon-carbon bonds, uh, which is not that easy. And so nature uses retroaldol reactions to do that. Uh, and we will talk about that in more detail later on in the semester. So for now, just remember that because it's an equilibrium, it can happen in both directions. Uh, we can have retroaldol reactions. Is this aldol product chiral? It is. So how is it going to form? Single enantiomer, racemic mixture. Racemic mixture, exactly. We'll get a racemic mixture. There are ways to use chiral catalysts in aldol reactions, but we're not going to discuss that uh, in this class. You'd have to take Chem 553 uh, to be able to learn about the chiral catalysts. But if we use a longer chain aldehyde, such as propion aldehyde, and we draw the product that we get, okay. How many possible, in terms of stereoisomers, how many possible products do we have in this case? How many stereocenters are there in this molecule? There's two. When we have two stereocenters, there are four stereoisomers that can form. So two diastereomers, and each of those diastereomers would be a racemic mixture. Okay? So for now, we're just going to recognize that all those products will exist. If you were to take Chem 553 next year or the year after, you would learn of ways of controlling the stereochemistry to get just one of those or maybe just two of those out of the four possible isomers. Okay? Uh, but we don't have time to, to discuss that in here. All right, there's something else that can happen in an aldol reaction. We can take our aldol product and treat it with hydroxide, and it can undergo a dehydration in the presence of base, forming a double bond. And of course, in dehydration reactions, you produce water. Your book, unfortunately, is a bit vague on the dehydration. Your book says sometimes the dehydration happens, other times it doesn't happen. Well, that is true, uh, but they should give you a little more information so that you can predict when it would happen and when it would not happen. Because you already have base present. If you look at the reaction conditions, you've already got base in there. So what's stopping this from undergoing this dehydration? Well, normally, in most aldol reactions, you need to add heat in order for the dehydration to occur. So what we're learning, which is not in the book, is that normally, if you want the dehydration to happen, you need to heat it up. Okay? But if your double bond has, will have extra conjugation, not just being conjugated to this carbonyl, being conjugated to something else in addition to the carbonyl, then it's going to happen spontaneously and you won't be able to stop the reaction at the beta hydroxy uh, ketone or aldehyde. So let's look at an example of that. Let's take acetophenone, which is a ketone. The aldol reaction is not going to be favorable in this case, as evidenced by the arrows I've drawn for you. Okay, so this is the product you would get by performing an aldol reaction with acetophenone. But I'm going to put this product in brackets because you're not going to be able to isolate it. As soon as it forms, it's going to undergo dehydration. And as I'm drawing the product for you, you should be thinking about why this particular aldol product undergoes spontaneous dehydration. 
Any ideas? Take a look at this product and compare it to the one I drew up here. Take a look at our double bond. How conjugate? Yes, Sydney? Yeah, it's got extra conjugation. In addition to being conjugated to the carbonyl, it's conjugated to the benzene ring. So whenever your double bond that would form has more conjugation than just the carbonyl, then it's going to happen spontaneously. Okay? So in this case, spontaneous dehydration, that's going to allow us, let's go ahead and write the water just to make sure we know it's forming, that's going to allow us to drive this reaction through the unfavorable aldol equilibrium. So sometimes you can perform a um, dehydration to drive a reaction through an unfavorable aldol equilibrium. Okay? Let's draw the mechanism of our dehydration. And it's not the same mechanism as dehydrations we learned in 351. Okay? It's a different mechanism. Step one, our hydroxide is going to deprotonate an alpha proton, make an enolate. Okay, we've seen that. That's not going to be a favorable process, but we're going to get some of the enolate. Okay. This is where we form our water, is in that enolate formation process. Okay. Now that we have the enolate, here we are going to have a favorable process. Our enolate is going to eliminate out our hydroxide, forming a double bond and spitting out hydroxide as our leaving group. Okay? So why does this work? Why hydroxide is a strong base? Why does this work as a leaving group in this elimination reaction? Any ideas? Is there anything about our product that makes it stable that would allow us to overcome the penalty of using a weak, uh, a poor leaving group. It's conjugated, exactly. This is a poor leaving group, but when you consider the fact that it is equivalent to the base we're using, it's not more basic than our initial base. So we're not really paying a thermodynamic penalty for having hydroxide as our leaving group in this case. And we're actually getting a benefit because if we look at the products compared to the reactants, we have this conjugation, okay? So this is a special mechanism. It is called E1CB. And the CB stands for conjugate base. It's an E1 mechanism because the elimination step is unimolecular. The base plays a role prior to that step. It's unimolecular, so it's E1, and it's from the conjugate base of our starting material. So E1CB, it's not E2. It's not a regular E1 mechanism. It's E1CB. So that's how the dehydration occurs. We'll pick up and discuss more about the aldol reaction on Monday.